So as you could see, we have a very balanced afternoon, gender balance, balance between practitioners and academics. Everything is a, a very good start. Uh, I am really pleased to have uh, here today Michael Lene, is Associate Professor in Economics at the University of Paris 8. Uh, he wants to talk about the way we can reconcile uh, prosperity and climate change mitigation. So the floor is yours for one hour, then we have three discussions. Where are they? One, two, three, no, not three. One, two. And, uh, and, and the debate with you. <laughs> okay. So thank you. I'm delighted to be here uh, among you all. Um, because we'll talk about maybe the most urgent um, topic of all, as far as economics is concerned. So how could we possibly tackle climate change? So, briefly put, here I will propose an alternative to capitalism, but still. So how to tackle climate change? For sure. I'm sure you're all aware here that we cannot possibly count on, well, self-regulation. Even in the form so far of uh, carbon pricing mechanisms and schemes, which so far has only bore sour fruits, right? We have a dismal presence. So um, we cannot count on personal responsibility or education. Because even if you change, or someone around you changes his or her habits, standards of living, then it will count only one eight billionth, because we are eight billion inhabitants on this planet, of what should be done. And, and it's not because you change that other people, that the other eight billion people around you will change. So. Well, and it's also a lame excuse for inaction by governments all around the planet to put the blame on consumers and do business as usual. So we cannot also count on future innovations. Well, because we need to tackle this issue right now in the next decade. So it's really urgent to tackle it effectively. And yet, this is the interesting starting point here, the resources do exist. The technology does exist to actually tackle climate change. So why don't we tackle effectively climate change? Because the problem, I would say, stems from the inertia of the economic system. There is a quote from Keynes that I very much like. He wrote 93 years ago that we are capable of shutting up the sun and the stars because it did not pay a dividend. We were so much capable of warming the planet because it did not pay a dividend that Climate change is still on the way. So I would say that there is a fundamental incompatibility between the firm's objectives, the, the objectives of corporations in a capitalist system, and actual climate change mitigation. So it does not pay a dividend to actually tackle climate change. Anytime a company has a choice to make between should I make money, money or should I actually fight climate change? Of course, the company would choose the first option. So here, I would like to propose an alternative to capitalism in order to actually tackle climate change and to mitigate the climate change that is underway. And because it is most urgent, we need, we have no choice but to be both radical and pragmatic. And I will explain to you uh, what this would imply. So the alternative I am proposing to you is, well, I called it climatism. 
Because capitalism revolves around accumulation of capital, we would say climatism revolves around, say, actually mitigating climate change. Um, so the basic idea is the following. The objective would be to change corporations' objective by changing by law the way shareholders' income is computed so that it may include a crucial environmental objective. And because shareholders appoint and dismiss managers, they devise monetary incentives so that managers' behavior may be aligned with their interests, then you will change corporations' behaviors. So the system would no longer revolve around the maximization of profits, but rather around actual climate change mitigation plus two other objectives that I will present to you in a few seconds. So the, the basic outline is this one. I hope I'm being clear. Do not hesitate if it's not. So the basic idea is to make self-interest compatible with a common ecological good. So anytime shareholders would wish to receive income, they should be effective in their fight against climate change by dismissing the bad managers, by devising the proper monetary incentives for managers, and so on and so forth. And here, the basic, let's say, tenet of this new system would say that the burden of adjustment would, should lay, lay on the shoulders of corporations. So they account for more than 90% of greenhouse gas emissions because for instance, let's say when you as a consumer, you use electricity, you use power, of course you should have a company that provides you with power. So I guess aligning the self-interest of shareholders and the common ecological good could be an efficient way to actually deal with climate change. So their shareholders' income, as you all know, Nowadays, it's called dividends, so I would rather propose, and because this is a different way of computing it, of determining it, I would propose a main payment from the Latin word emendo, which means to repair. Because we need to repair the planet, what we did, right? Um, instead of dividing something, mm -hmm. that would be profits. A dividend, divide something. So, here is the big formula. So here you have E for Eman, like the new way of calculating the maximum amount that shareholders could distribute to themselves. This is a distributable amount of money. Of course they could vote not to distribute this amount, not more but they could vote to distribute a bit less according to their other objectives. So here, DWP means global warming potential. This is a metric for uh, assessing the impact on climate by the company's activity because well, anytime you do something as a company or even as an individual, you contribute to global warming. And because you have many greenhouse gases, well, scientists have devised a common metric, which is global warming potential. So here you see one objective, right? In order to have income, shareholders should be effective with regard to those objectives. Reducing, curbing, cutting, their greenhouse gas emissions. I mean, the greenhouse gas emissions of their company. So the second objective here, well, let's say the second objective is this one, I. I means, stands for net investment. So to speak, this is a proxy, let's say it's a proxy for macroeconomic prosperity. 
We'll see later on why an investment, any kind of investment, of course, this could be, and this should be ecological investment, but any kind of investment, is a proxy for macroeconomic investment. We'll see later on why. So you have the first objective. The primary objective is to tackle climate change, second objective, to achieve to the possible extent and as much as possible <coughs> prosperity. And then the third objective would be within the company, well, let's say social justice or social <coughs> equality, right? W stands for wages, Y for production. This is very classical. Except that in Y, we exclude top executive wages. Because as you know, top executives are also well, employees. So here you have three criteria, and each corresponds to a specific objective. So the more efficient with regard to each objective, the more income shareholders could get. But here you have if and only if. Because of course, not every not all the objectives here are, are created equal. There is one primary objective, and namely, this is actual climate change mitigation. The aim is to cut. <coughs> For each company, the aim would be to cut its greenhouse gas emissions. So, any time, this means that any time the company is increasing its emissions, then it would not be allowed to distribute immense income to its shareholders. So if and only if this is negative, so you cut the emissions. And of course, the income is proportional to your success. The more you succeed in cutting emissions, the more income shareholders could get. Again, the idea is to make self-interest as much compatible as possible with the common ecological good. So let's delve a little bit into details. We have a saying in French which says, the devil is in the details. So let's talk to the devil. Because, well, details matter. So primary objective here should be evident. I for climate change mitigation. And there is also a secondary objective, namely macroeconomic prosperity here, the net, net investments of the company. So, of course, if this is negative, so if a company do, does not implement investment, it should not be allowed to distribute income to its shareholders. But there should not be any offsetting this objective with this one. This is really the primary objective. So you cannot, cannot say, for instance, OK, I increase greenhouse gas emissions. But at the same time, well, I could uh, have uh, big investments, and then it's OK. There is no setting it because there is an if and only if condition. So you cannot offset one objective with the other. Right? You should, in order to have income, in order for shareholders to have income, you should curb, you should cut your greenhouse gas emissions. So this is really the primary objective here. And the secondary objective would be macroeconomic prosperity. So the idea is, as the title suggests, to reconcile the two as much as possible. I'm not saying it's always reconcilable. You can't always reconcile them. But if this is reconcilable, then it should allow it, it should enable it. So the aim is to constantly drive companies to imagine new ways to cut their greenhouse gas emissions. So, and in this formula, I should say from the outset that all kinds of emissions should be included. 
mainly including the emissions by providers. Otherwise, it would be too easy. Companies would not change their behavior. So they should ask their providers how much greenhouse gas emissions they, well, how, mu how, yeah, how much gas they emitted through their activity. And it should also include the delivery of goods. so that you may take heed of all the consequences of your activity. That's the point here. You should take into account all the consequences of your activity and not just conveniently uh, have your activity, yeah? No. I was going to say, because you said all the consequences of your activity, but say if it was a firm that was uh, a solar panel building firm where the consequences of that activity is like, despite the fact it might be um, emitting due to its production because the national grid hasn't quite caught up with their aims, the consequences of that activity, aka producing solar panels, yeah. is that consequence they like taken into consideration when you, with firms that are doing a environmentally good thing? Yeah, all, all activities. Anytime they purchase something to a provider, well, it has an impact on the planet, on, on the climate. So you should take this into account. So that you are compelled or you have an incentive to choose another provider which would be better for the planet. The idea is to in push companies to better choose their providers. So that, yeah, really it's to align the interests of the companies with let's say the interest of the planet, so, so to speak, right? Is it, is it mm -hmm. clearly like this? No, it's not clear. Tell me. No? No, no. Oh, you yeah, said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There is something very fundamental that I don't understand, that yes. dividends today are some fraction of profits. Yeah. So what is the source of these events? Yeah. We'll come to this after. Okay. I have a... Uh, this is a good point. But uh, it, it, to answer you, I should skip many parts, so I'll answer it later. Yeah, but it's not out of profits. Not out of profits, but yeah. Okay, is it clear so far, or do not hesitate? Yeah, I think I, I, yeah. Um, it, as I understood your yeah. question, it was like that if a company produces solar panels, yeah. And because they want to do climate mitigation, yeah. they increase their uh, production a lot. But due to this, as they purchase solar panels and this emits emission, their emissions increase due to their investment, although they produce solar panels which have climate mitigation. Yeah. Is it then not that they couldn't pay dividends? Because they increase the emissions by doing more. Yeah, then they have an incentive to be more efficient just in the production of so solar panels, not in the use of solar panels. Yeah, and they have. Of course, we may say, of course, if they produce more solar panels, and so to speak, this is uh, good, and then they have an incentive to produce even more efficiently this. Mm. Because then you have also, so to speak, a, a choice when you're an electricity producer to invest in your own production devices so that they may, may be more efficient, so that in the process of production you may emit fewer gases, I would say. Okay. But you have a point. I see which. Okay. So, and the government should issue guidelines basically saying for every kind of activity, uh, say, you emit that much for one uh, stay in a, in a, in a hotel, like, let's say Venezuela or in Indonesia, you emit that amount of GWP, of green global warming potential. And guidelines already exist. These guidelines should be mandatory, it should be a, shouldn't be a fantasy, a fancy of um, of companies, they should not be allowed to assess it the way they see fit. 
and well, this should divide by guidelines. Here, the global warming potential here should be an average between the impact on the climate at a 20-year time span and a 100-year time span. Because there is one major um, greenhouse gas, namely methane, which has a shorter life expectancy than uh, carbon dioxide. And that's why it, it um, accounts for 42% of the greenhouse gas, uh, the global warming at a 20 year time span, while it accounts only for around 20, 21% at a 100 year time span. And yet, the issue is so dire, the, the issue is so important that you should tackle it also in the short term or the medium term. So that's why I say here that JWP should be an average between 20 year and 100 year because both time horizons matter. So I see it as a way to achieve degrowth or a post growth society, meaning that you deprioritize your growth. Growth is not <coughs> the primary objectives anymore, is no not anymore the primary objective of the economic system, with the understanding that it may result in a fall of GDP. Not necessarily, this is not a synonymous with recession, but it may mean a fall in GDP as we currently measure it. It does not forbid growth, because as you see, there is a second objective here, investment. <laughs> investments refer to production capabilities. Um, so you could still have growth, but then by design, should it happen, should you have growth, it would be growth without global warming, because if there is global warming, it means that this increases, and then you're not allowed to distribute income to shareholders. Yeah. So would the company not be able to like invest and just grow and have more and more emissions, but then like they just keep the profits on the side to distribute later? No, they can't, because this is the formula to distribute pro not not profits. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not made out of profits. Mm -hmm. So you're not allowed by law. You just pass one law, yes. which says this is the way to compute shareholders income. So anytime you increase the greenhouse gas emissions, you're not allowed to distribute income. Mm -hmm. So shareholders won't wait like five years or 10 years, or 20 years in the hope that one year, one time, eventually you would uh, cut. But if they put it in, in like a provision or something and keep on building a big, so then what would be the point? Well, because then you grow growing to build up a really big provision to them also. Yeah, but without income, could shareholders be happy without income? The value would, I mean, potentially. Maybe the way that on financial markets they consider value would be different because no longer revolving around profits. So the assessment on financial market would not be how profitable is this company, rather <coughs> How good is it, how efficient is it when it comes to these three objectives? So I would say the way to consider things on financial market because of this, this simple change, well, it will be different. Thank you, quickly. I really like the idea. I'm just curious about what about already ecological or green, let's say, uh, and, um, companies or new companies? How would that formula work? Because for already like, let's say, hypothetical uh, zero impact economies, they wouldn't be able, they couldn't be, uh, uh, firms, they couldn't reduce their, in, their impact. Yeah, but could it exist Just investment? a company without any impact on the climate? The, the closer you are to that situation, the more you're penalized by this formula, let's say. Yeah, you, you don't have space to reduce. Yeah, but it's a relative change. Right, it's a relative change. So you could, there, here, 
The idea is to constantly drive you to be better. It's a, it's a relative change. Not, it's not in absolute terms. You, you would be absolutely right if it were in absolute terms. So this is a relative change. So you are always, always pushed to improve and to do better when it comes to uh, reducing your impact on the planet. I suggest to keep the question okay. just for understanding the problem of the okay, okay, now okay. and the debate no, it's which is really interesting after because we discuss it. Okay. So I like to engage yeah, with people. Right. And <laughs> and I suggest, and I suggest okay. also that for the next seminars I will pick up someone to be the chair. Uh, to <laughs> act as a chair for the session, which is not so easy. Okay. I'm not sure if this is a question of understanding or debates. <laughs> um, the formula is, so even if these events are not taken out of profits, I don't know yet, but are they and the wage share, do they come from the same source, as in from, I think, retail earnings or something? In that case, there is a, um, it, it, both of them come from the same source. And if the formula is linear in the wage share, then is that not a conflict? Because there is no point of optimizing emails versus the wage share. Uh, is it versus Bec if they are coming from the same source, then both, well, both of them uh, are not necessarily come from, from the same source. You could have an increase. Um, you could have an increase in let's say, the wage, uh, the income of shareholders and still have a reduction in inequalities if wages increase more than shareholders' income. Because it's also relative. And also you, to put away the wages of top executives. But it's, it does not really come from the same source we'll talk about. I have, so this is my last point. If I, I, I can okay. urge you to wait a little bit. Okay, so... so uh, uh, okay. um, so, what it, it is not. To understand what it is, we should also um, have a few words about what it's not. So it's not what sometimes has been called the green bottom line, meaning you try to evaluate in your accounting, in your books, some kind of damage cost, some kind of, or some kind of financial impact of damaging the planet. So this is not the same thing as this. This is not also what has been called purpose-driven corporations. In a few countries, uh, new laws were enacted with a view to say, well, the main objective of companies, of course, it's profits. We should maximize profit, but should they wish to, uh, corporations could nonetheless pursue a different objective, namely climate change mitigation. But this is not mandatory, and so long as you have two conflicting goals, on the one hand, maximization of profit, on the other hand, well, to actually mitigate climate change, companies still prefer to maximize profits. <coughs> there is no compulsory here, um, change in objectives with these kinds of um, reforms. So this is not some kind of uh, voluntary indicator which are now rife on the biggest financial uh, markets. Right? The big companies, like they do greenwashing all the time and they, in their profit and loss statement and in all their financial statements, they like to try to assess their impact on the planet. But period, it's merely greenwashing. It does not translate into a mandatory objective. Uh, well, it's just to, to be attractive to the public, just to communicate. And it does not uh, translate into a real change from them. This is merely a matter of communication. So here, the point here is that this change in objective would be compulsory. Should shareholders want to receive an income, they should, so to speak, be successful with regard to these three objectives, and the most important being actual climate change mitigation. So what, would it be a credible alternative? 
because the system would no longer revolve around the maximization of profit. So we may ask ourselves, is it credible? Wouldn't it scare people? In a context where there is, Alice, unfortunately, a growing skepticism when it comes to climate change mitigation. I would say it's so urgent, we need to do to radically change alter the economic system in the next decade, so it's so urgent that we should be both radical and pragmatic. So it's a radical alternative because companies would not intend to maximize profits anymore. Because their shareholders have the upper hand on the economic system. They are the ones appointing managers, dismissing them, and devising monetary incentives. So, so to speak, it consists of backfiring financialization on itself. You know that the fact that shareholders have taken power, you should use it to backfire the system on itself. And at the same time, I would say it's pragmatic because it has just implied to pass one law. Just one law is all it takes. There, is no, there would be no tax hike. There would be no government intervention. There would be no touching property rights. You do not bar people. You do not forbid people from getting rich. You instead you merely redefine the conditions, the very conditions of wealth accumulation. In order to be rich, then people should be successful with regard to actual climate change mitigation. So you merely redefine the conditions. You do not pe forbid people from being rich. You do not interfere with management. You merely change the objective. And then you let managers free to choose or to imagine the ways to achieve this new objective. So there is no big government fear behind this. Because we know the state of the media, the state of the intellectual debates in at least all countries that I know, it's not very favorable for radical alternatives. And any time you plea for a big change, then you have the scarecrow, you have uh, the fear, this great fear of big government, and this is not the case because all it takes is to pass one law. And also, it would be easy to pay high emails. So first of all, it's a matter of calibration. You may wonder why you have here all these figures, all these numbers, especially the 30, the 2, you have numbers here. So I calibrated the formula so that, so to, to show that it, in the past, it would have been possible to pay more emens than actual dividends any time the country was successful with regard to climate change mitigation. So I did, I did my calculations for two countries, the US and France, so as to arrive at these numbers. Right, just to show that, for instance, in the year uh, 2012, the US, it's the only year where the US U.S. corporations could have paid more amends than dividends, the only year. During 20 years, they would have not have been allowed to distribute the slightest amend. Um, and if my memory does not fail me, it would mean during this year a, um, a cutting of greenhouse gas emissions by around 5%. My memory does not fail me. So it's it's the kind of cut we encourage with this, with this calibration, right? Just to make the calculations in the past. I mean, of course, in the past, you were under capitalism. You did not have this change in objective. It was merely a matter of calibration. 
to show shareholders that it's relatively easy to have high income by abiding by this law, by respecting these new objectives. Because it is a matter of social acceptability also. They should be convinced that it is in their best interest also. And also, the second goal of this calibration is to show that this reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is sufficient to um, divert or to mitigate climate change. So it would be easy to pay high emissions also, and I have two examples that I like. I, I will take two examples. Uh, you know that transportation is one of the biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. And yet it would be very easy to reduce your impact. For instance, if you choose to have a railway freight instead of transportations by 40 tons trucks, then you divide your emissions by 11 per kilometer. You divide by 11 emissions. So this is one example. It would be relatively easy for companies to drastically cut their emissions should, should they have this objective. Another example is with, with the solar panels or wind offshoring uh, power plants. You could divide your emissions by using this kind of electricity by 30. You could divide it by, by 30 over its life cycle. Of course, you should always think in terms of life cycle emissions. So to switch from one source of electricity to the other allows you as a company to pay very high emissions very high. We have the technology. We have the resources. Right? It's a matter of objectives, I would say. So, social acceptance should be high. Should be. I mean, no excuse. Right? You shareholders, you have no excuse. You constituents, you have no excuse. You could be very rich with this system by actually tackling climate change. And also I have two other points here, why it is pragmatic, and these are my two next points. I hope to show you that this is an interesting paradox with climatism, that by not pursuing profit anymore, the system has a, as a whole will have higher profits. So even if companies do not intend to maximize profits, as a whole, the economy could have higher profits. Intriguing. And also, we may say it's, it's a kind of a flexible policy tool. And we'll see why. These would be my next two points. So, so let's talk about the macroeconomic consequences of this reform, should it be enacted, should it be implemented. Well, this is a truism. You're all aware, we'll all agree that actually ta tackling climate change would imply heavy investments. And it's good because in the Eman formula, I should be positive. I means net investment, investment minus amortizations and depreciations, right? So. It would imply I, I and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Thus, the, the important point here, it will translate, it will trigger a, ri a rise in macroeconomic investments. Because all companies would have this incentive, this powerful incentive to increase their investments. Therefore, there would be an increase in macroeconomic I mean, it is very likely. So, all else equal, the overall level of profits should be higher. 
because maybe you're, you're very familiar with this, so I will be very quick on this, right? So as you know, you have two ways of calculating GDP. Y stands for GDP here, because every kind of activity has always, like a coin, two sides. So it's the same with, uh, with GDP. So you have the expenditure side, the definition of GDP with, on the income side, yeah? But by profits here, you mean profits measured in the conventional economic way, or do you mean the aggregate of the amounts? Aggregate. That, I, I'm talking about but macroeconomics. The amends, of the amounts or of like conventional profits? Microeconomic profits. All right. Because amounts are not based on profits. So, um, so I, I'm just talking about the classical, let's say, macroeconomics. So when you have uh, <coughs> pi stands for profits, right? Yep. Um, sorry, one question. If we consider climate change mitigation in this model, uh, wouldn't we also expect that uh, normal macroeconomic profits would also decrease in a way if the actions against climate change that some companies would have to stop doing things that are making huge profits and that are very bad for the climate? Well, that, that's the interesting. Uh, I will, this is a demonstration that I would like to admit. You have a point. Uh, we may think this. I mean, it's, it's sensible to to think of this. But on a macroeconomic perspective, if this is true, then you have higher profits. Just, um, this is the typical, for those familiar with uh, Kalitskin macroeconomics, so maybe you see my point here. I don't you see me coming, although I'm very discreet. Uh, so given that consumption here is consumption by capitalists, plus consumption by workers, then you have this profit, macroeconomic profit equation, which basically says the higher the investment, the higher the profits. Regardless of the microeconomic, this is a typical macroeconomic equation. Um, maybe we could delve into, is there a huge discrepancy between microeconomic profits and macroeconomic profits? This would be a big issue, but from a macroeconomic perspective, I would say, well, uh, well therefore, here, um, so we have the final equation that is important for us. Um, the higher the investment, the higher profits, but could we expect all else to be equal? The point here is you implement climatism, you have immense instead of dividends. Could it be the case that because investments are higher, profits would be higher, then it depends on the all else equal. And of course, yeah, here on the, in this equation, I, there are two assumptions, right? <coughs> we assume away government balance, the existence of any deficit, and we assume away trade, international trade. So it would be more complicated if we include commercial trade. But I would say, we may uh, revert to this after. It will be more nuanced, but I would say the conclusion would remain more or less the same if we include. This is just as a matter for the sake of simplicity, right? That we most of the time make these assumptions. So could the savings of workers remain equal. Because if there is a rise in savings, if savings increase, then it would offset the increase in investment. So we could not conclude macroeconomic profits would be higher. Well, it is an op open question. <laughs> um, on the one hand, as with any novelty, uh, the implementation of this new reform could frighten a few people so that there may be more precautionary savings on the one hand. On the other hand, there may be less precautionary savings because some people would feel elated, happy, that at once, at long last, we tackle climate change. So on balance, I don't know. What would be the answer? 
I would say it remains an open question. Even if you fear any novelty, after a few years, if you see it working, you feel less. So maybe in the medium run, it shouldn't be much of a problem, this hypothetical increase in precautionary savings. So, and here it depends basically on past levels of profits. So you, it begs the question. So you have twice the same question, I would say. So I would say it's very likely that we have this system higher microeconomic profits. And it's an interesting paradox, I would say. Although companies no longer aim at maximizing profits as a whole, on average, they have higher profits on average. Of course, a few of them may be worse. Here, the idea is to make climate change mitigation as much compatible with prosperity as possible. Here, it's more obvious, I guess, why I took I as a proxy for macroeconomic prosperity. Because the macroeconomic level of profits depend on I, on investment. So here, the next point is this formula, of this Eman formula, this climate system uh, reform, offers you, gives you another tool, another p policy tool. It is very much flexible. So should you wish to alter the balance of objectives, because among the three objectives, you have a certain balance. The most important one being uh, climate change mitigation, the second one being macroeconomic prosperity, the third one being uh, so fighting uh, social inequalities, you may wish to alter the coefficients between them to, re to mirror um, the importance of the current funding uh, objective. And although it was uh, designed in the first place to tackle climate change, you may add in the future other ecological objectives, namely the ecological footprint. You could add an ecological footprint or a material footprint. Once the measure is accepted, the reform is accepted by the population, you may add other objectives. It is flexible, does not have to have this form once and for all. You know, the form one idea. Uh, does not have to have this form once and for all. You could add objectives, times ecological footprint, times the recycling purposes, times pollution, the reduction in pollution, and so on and so forth. So because, of course, there is more when it comes to the environment than climate change. This is the most urgent issue, but there are many other issues environmental issues. That's why you, it offers you this flexibility. You may add something in the future. Okay. And because profit do not take center stage anymore, there would be no point in levying a tax on corporate income. So you should replace it with another tax, let's say a tax on waste or some other ecological tax instead. <coughs> of course, we may wonder what would happen if the company pays more emens than it is allowed to do. Of course, anytime you have a law, you have violations of the law. So what would happen if you pay more income to shareholders than you're allowed to? We may, for instance, uh, say that, of course, there could be fines, or you may um, forbid managers who allow this to manage any company for the next 20 years or 30 years, for instance. You know, in some countries, when you go bankrupt, you're not allowed to manage anymore. So this could be the same here. If you violate the law, you're not allowed to manage anymore all the top executives that let this happen. So this is just to be 
uh, comprehensive. So, what would be the role of prophets? The big question. This is for the end. Um, bankruptcy rules will still apply in this system, which means that you cannot afford in the long run to be too unprofitable, to run up enormous losses. So you still go, can go bankrupt. So profits would have a secondary role to play. Not, it would not be the primary objective with a view to maximizing it, but it would still have a role to play. Because when it comes to bankruptcy, well, it has a role to play. We may wonder also, how could we fund, how could we finance investments? Because we're uh, used to thinking of profits in terms of financing investments. So may, we may wonder if we no longer care about profits, would it be possible still to finance investments on a microeconomic perspective? So, um, so first of all, let's dwell on the fact that profit is not a monetary notion. You have many bookkeeping entries that, comes, uh, that come in the calculation of profits that are not monetary at all. Inventories, the change in inventories, it's not monetary. Uh, amortization and depreciations, they're not monetary. Uh, you have also debt collection issues, right? You may have, um, someone may have a debt uh, and you may not get paid. Uh, or you may have delays. Uh, so profit is not a monetary notion. So it may happen, and it happens all the time, that you're not really profitable and still have plenty of cash at your disposal. And also conversely, it may happen that you're profitable and you have no cash. It may happen. I'm not saying it's the general case. This is just one point. Um, and currently, in the financialized system, the fact that you had past profits, that you had profits in the past, in the name of retained earnings, does not give you the slightest guarantee that they will remain, so to speak, in the company, because then you may in the future pay your shareholders. And in fact, this is even what happens, especially in the US, because when you add as you know, buybacks and dividends, uh, companies uh, actually run into debt in order to satisfy their shareholders. So this is what happens right now. Um, also, we may expect, this is another point, we may expect higher microeconomic profits, which means on microeconomic terms that on average, companies would be better off. Of course, you may have, because this is an average, a few companies that are not better off, but they should, or it is very likely that they should be better off. Plus, another point here is when you undergo a recession. It implies most of the time that investment is on the way, right? Investment plummets. Uh, so, currently, when you undergo a recession, companies still pay hefty sums to their shareholders. And in this system, this would not be allowed. Because when I is negative, you cannot pay your shareholders. So, the company would keep its money anytime there is a recession. And this is sound management to keep money when there is a recession, I would say. So how does it translate into accounting? I guess this is, well, it's a point, and this is a finishing point. Um, I see, I mean, this will be open to debate, two options possible. Maybe one that will, well, I don't know. So two options. First, to consider that these emens are, so to speak, the compensation for the role or the work or the activity of shareholders would be, so to speak, a cost. 
So in accounting terms, it would be a cost. So regardless of profits, it would be a cost. Or there is a second possibility, second option. So either the first option or the second one. Or you consider that you have an asset. Anytime you're successful with regard to actual climate change mitigation, you have an asset. Because you contribute to the greater good. So, so to speak, this is an asset. And on the liability side, because you should always have uh, this balance, you should have an account, a bookkeeping entry, which I propose to label environmental responsibility, which is a debt you have on your shell. Well, which is a debt shareholders have on the company. And any time you, as a company, you pay shareholders, then you deplete this entry by depleting the bank account. Well, I guess uh, this is pretty much it. Thanks for listening. Uh, and we need the floor to the three discussants. Just a comment. So, what you're saying is we'll have to rewrite economic, rewrite economics. So, my bachelor, four year bachelor was all about profit maximizing. And now I'm thinking that it wouldn't be the case. <laughs> so it's like four here. So we should we should we will have to read other economic books that will not tell us the role of capitalities to maximize profit. I, I guess it's a very flawed way of conceiving. And I think you can answer this very interesting question just after the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe you can take your seat. Uh, yeah. um, I take the chair there. Okay. If you wish to have this, and John Andrade, he's Bjarne and Talita, and we're going to present to discuss a little bit the paper uh, principle thing for, for the presentation. So this is going to be the outline of our presentation. But firstly, we are, we are going to address some concepts that we consider like relevant or a kind of uh, contribution of the paper. Well, uh, after that, we're going to discuss some specific aspect of the rule and the whole proposal. And at the end, we're going to make uh, some conclusions to encourage the discussion. Uh, so first of all, uh, where do we stand? I, think I would like to start like with the current state of mitigation in 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 the world. So I'm taking reference in Google and Jason Hickel uh, most recent paper. At the end, like they show that only 13 uh, high-income countries have achieved absolute decoupling emissions regarding GDP, and you can see that uh, the green line, is the, the red dashed line, is going to be like uh, the cool if all the, these countries follow the current trend in, in, in the coupling. However, like the blue dash line shows like what should be achieved to say in 1.5 Celsius degree, consider like a fair share of uh, the remaining carbon budget. So you can see that basically with current trends, even at the end of the century, we're not going to achieve anything. And what does it mean? Is basically that current uh, international commitments, but also domestic policies are not uh, in ambitious enough to to address uh, to avoid the climate crisis. So basically, we have like two nice concepts uh, based on the IPCC. The first one is emissions gap. It's basically when you add all the national determined contributions of all the countries to the Paris Agreement, they are not enough to stay at 2.2 <coughs> Celsius degrees. But also, even if those NDCs are not enough, they are also not being uh, implemented. So basically, we have a kind of underinvestment in mitigation in, in the public and private sectors. So what's the main contribution of the paper we, we see is basically it's a kind of instrument to accelerate uh, the coping rates, but also tackling this private underinvestment, and basically by changing the whole system of incentives of the corporate sector. So what we find relevant is a kind of uh, uh, idea to go to go into uh, corporate social responsibility, as, as you know, these this, this are the kind of voluntary commitments that corporations make 
to, to seem like environmentally friendly or respecting like uh, labor standards or uh, this kind of uh, objectives but what the evidence says is basically that the actions are so broad and the objectives are so broad that basically they are uh, inefficient in achieving uh, them. Also, we have like all these actions are perceived by shareholders, with, by financial markets, as simply as cost. And finally, uh, even though the uh, on the theory they are a kind of signaling device to address uh, asymmetries of information, basically they are uh, sometimes used for greenwashing or just for reputation. So, at the end, like the proposal uh, tries to uh, address that, basically having regulatory commitments, but also having an internalization of what we commonly say, like externalities, but not based on price system or the business ethics, but on property, because we have to acknowledge that the unequal responsibilities regarding climate change, and especially shareholders, because they concentrate the property. And at the end, it's acknowledge like the current dynamics of the economy, in which like uh, max maximizing shareholder value <coughs> is relevant. And also, our nice concept we, we saw a little bit was uh, about rethinking corporate governance and ideas, what's the role of corporations? And basically, what we see is that corporations are not isolated in entities or institutions in, in the economy, but they, they could have like kind of social responsibility. So this, this opens the door to democratize a little bit the objectives, but also the, the, the decision-making processes of corporations, uh, for instance, to avoid this kind of tragedy of origin in climate change, that basically these corporations are usually tend to be more short-term based. And at the end, like uh, I think I'm not going to uh, discuss this too much, but at the end, like this idea of seeing the transition not just as a cost, like or distribution just as a cost. So basically, we have very functional and distribution for workers, but also we cross uh, investment they could be like actually beneficial for, for the whole economy at the macro level, maybe for some specific sectors, not necessarily. So at the end, would be like the paralyzed for post uh, at the end. So uh, after that, we're going to deal now, I'm going to leave the floor to Talita and Bjarne to the for the discussion. Okay. So mainly we have four main topics we're going to discuss. Uh, first, the corporate governance structure and financialization, macroeconomic impacts, the company's decision-making process, and capital flight. I'm going to talk about the first two. Uh, corporate governance, usually we think as a uniform system of controls that the shareholders can always make uh, some kind of change inside the company uh, management. But we have clearly a really American-centered model here. Is we have, because the corporate governance, uh, the pressure that their shareholders can make, it's ensured by the market for corporate control. So if the shareholders are not compliant with what the measurement is doing, they can go to the market, share their sales, put the price down, and they can make pressure on the, on the measurement to, to achieve it. That's the outsider control system that's prevalent in the USA, uh, and the insider control system mainly in Europe. Of course, there is like an ample spectrum of how the countries are, each country is different, but we say that if there's no enough uh, mechanisms to the shareholders to make pressure to the management, it can be a problem to this kind of uh, policy, uh, policy tool. Uh, at the same time, if you have countries with incipient financial system of with high incidence of small and medium enterprises, it can be limited. So namely, developing countries, it's harder for them to follow this policy instrument because they don't have the right tools or the regulation to follow this kind of uh, policy. So we might think that, okay, we need to develop financial markets to reduce CO2 emissions, that's one logic thing. But the results of this kind of policy making, it's conflicting. We have countries that they were able to reduce CO2 emissions with increasing the level of financialization of the country and the other way around. So if you don't design this kind of uh, development of financial market well, you might have the opposite. So you still have some kind of uh, details to see when it comes to developing countries or countries that they are not well developed financially like the US. And even in the US, when we talk about macroeconomic impact, we're going to say, okay, all companies are going to have the same objectives, they are going to achieve macroeconomic impact. But how real is the financial world? How real are the, the corporations? How they are integrated to the real economic system? Not necessarily they represent the real economy itself because we still have lots of medium and small enterprises that are not listed in the stock market. 
even in the US, the most developed uh, financial market in the world, uh, the employment in public corporations, nowadays it represents less than 30% of the total employment of the country. So when we talk about, okay, we can reduce inequalities with the formula and etc., but we're just taking this less than 30% of employers in the US, which is not a work, and it can be a little limiting to, the, to all the macroeconomic impact we're going to have. Uh, when it comes to contribution to GDP and CO2 emissions, it's kind of more complicated to calculate. The only data I could find was about the employment in public corporations. So the main topic here is like how relevant these fin financialized companies they are in real world economies. It can have a limit on how the macroeconomic impact is going to operate in the country. So now I leave to Fiona. Yeah, <coughs> I'm going to. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to break anything. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the company's decision-making process because just because we uh, changed the formula doesn't necessarily mean that we actually uh, achieve the objective that we have. Because uh, there is the possibility, based on the formula that is presented in the paper, for perverse effects. For example, um, if you look at this, for example, here, then this is the way we would want this to work, right? Companies would keep reducing their, uh, their emissions from year to year and in the end would receive their fair share of amends for this action. However, there are possible strategies that work exactly the other way around, where you would increase your amends, however your uh, carbon emissions would actually increase. One of these examples would be, for, uh, for instance, that, um, in that it makes sense to, to increase your emissions first to pay higher dividends in the next quarter. This is possible because there is no penalty for increasing your emissions. So, <coughs> for example, I could say, okay, in, as a company, it might make sense to now increase my emissions first and accept that I'm not getting any amends in the first quarter, but in the next quarter, when I'm then going to apply my carbon reduction uh, policies, then I'm going to have an even greater uh, reduction in CO2 and thus um, receive higher amends in the end. Another possibility uh, would be that uh, since this, uh, the reduction of the, um, of the carbon emissions is multiplied by the investments, it might make sense for the firm to wait with their uh, emission reduction policies two quarters where they, have very where they know they will have very high net investment because of a long-term planned investment project, something like this for, this, for example. This is also possible because the formula does not foresee any uh, penalty for not reducing your uh, carbons during some quarters and instead uh, makes it possible for these perverse effects. Now I understand this is not a fundamental criticism, there's probably a lot of instances where this wouldn't even be possible, but it leaves open the possibility for some companies, especially those that could implement um, uh, um, reduction policies very easily. For example, service-based uh, companies, uh, when they, instead of sending their consultants, for example, around the world by plane, instead they would just um, give consultancy over um, web-based uh, platforms, for example. Just to give you an example. And then there are also some problems with uh, cases in which, um, in some special cases, for example, when we have a very, very high decrease in emissions in one quarter, the cost of amends for the company that they would have to pay out might exceed everything that the company would be able to pay for. And in that sense, uh, and in that moment, it might be more reasonable for the company to just slowly decrease their emissions, even though they would be able to uh, decrease them very, very fast to ensure that we have payable and slow uh, and, and, uh, and constant um, immense to be paid out. And another problem is, although this was discussed uh, uh, pre uh, already here very briefly, was what happens when companies are very, very close to the zero line or actually are at the zero line. Of course, it is hard to imagine right now that uh, companies might have zero CO2 emissions whatsoever. But for example, if we open the possibility for, um, for carbon offsetting or things like that, we could even have negative emissions in that sense, and the question is, how do we treat companies like that? Again, this is not a fundamental criticism, but it must be accompanied for uh, in the, um, in the uh, formula to calculate the amends, which would arguably make it much more complicated. 
Um, the next point here, I'm just going to go over some further criticisms because we're running out of time. Uh, one point that I would like to uh, address is that there is not really a time urgency. So if you compare it to the uh, harshly criticized uh, um, emission trading system, the benefit of that one is that if it would work as intended, we would know exactly that there will not be any emissions by 2050 with the implementation of amends and how it was in the paper discussed to get rid of these uh, carbon uh, market schemes and so on, um, that wouldn't guarantee us that we will not have any emissions by 2050. For what, for what we know, it would be possible that we still emit carbon by 2100. Um, as long as we have a steady payout of amends, um, this would not necessar necessarily be against this, um, this notion. Also, uh, there's some issues with monitoring of compliance, especially if we say, for example, that carbon offsetting would be a possibility, like in, the, um, like in these uh, regulatory um, um, things that you mentioned in the paper as well. For example, carbon offsetting could be a way of how a company could um, basically hide that they actually pollute more, because with these uh, policies, it is, it is questionable if they actually reduce carbon or not. Um, but it is also highly questionable if uh, the emissions can be reliably computed. Of course, it is addressed in the paper that there are already some uh, recommendations on how they could be computed. However, it is questionable how accurate this actually is, and especially if we say that shareholders have a right, a, a strong right, to their amends. Uh, it is also questionable if these calculation methods hold in front of the court. Uh, if the shareholders decided to, to sue companies for not paying out enough amends because they are calculated wrongly. Um, there's also a justice question. Um, if we accept uh, the premise that it gets harder and harder to reduce your carbon emissions as you decrease them, uh, even at a percentual level, um, this is possible, then we would basically penalize companies that already started uh, decreasing their emissions while uh, and going back to uh, perverse effects, for them it might even be reasonable to increase their emissions again, just so they can keep on paying out a reasonable amount of uh, amends. But also we have the problem that since we take into account the whole production process, um, that downstream companies would basically benefit from the reduction of the upstream companies, from the suppliers. So even if they uh, did not uh, reduce their carbon emissions at all, but luckily the people they uh, import materials from reduce them, they are now able to pay out amends. It's also questionable if this is just. Uh, of course, it's not so much about the functioning, but if we wanted to uh, implement this policy, these are definitely questions that are going to be asked. Um, and for the last point, um, the paper also discusses capital flight and why it is unreasonable to think that companies would just leave the countries where we implement this policy uh, and produce in countries where they are allowed to still keep on profit maximizing and paying out dividends because the amends could be just as high um, and maybe even higher than the dividends, so there's no, no reason to do that. However, there is also the possibility of, let's say, soft capital flight, in which they would just start declaring their profits in other countries where this is not uh, applied, such that they could still benefit from the positive macroeconomic impacts in the countries where amends are uh, paid out, but they wouldn't be relying on these amends as their income because they would just declare the profits in other countries where they could still keep on paying out the dividends. And the last point that I would like to make is that we could also think about outsourcing the pollution to pollution havens. For example, it might be reasonable to think that it's if, let's say, uh, in the EU we would implement this policy, that it would be hard to track for the EU how much pollution actually comes about in the production process in China. But if we decide to move our, some of our production plants to China uh, and thereby hide some of the pollution that is actually produced by companies, this also questions the whole credibility of the system. I think these are all points that need to be addressed. Uh, as a conclusion, I have just a few questions for you. Uh, the first one is about the concept of prosperity and political feasibility and political economy of this kind of proposal. Uh, first of all, is this policy too appropriate to achieve sustainable development? Or does it, does it pursue a post-growth uh, economy? The thing is, uh, we still, it's still not clear if we should grow or not. It's just like about the shareholders that should keep earning their own dividends, their own income, in a different way. We're still 
working towards the shareholders to keep having their source of income, even though it's, it has a penalty for climate change. Uh, so it's just to think about it, is it proper to achieve sustainable development since companies were never able to tackle lots of your objectives when it comes to climate change? Uh, and the political feasibility is how easy it is to implement such kind of things. Some countries, they don't even have taxes for dividends. How can we change how the dividends are going to be calculated? Is like How is the lobby of shareholders, of institutional investors, going to act upon it? How is concerns like the current power relations? How can we move and do this kind of stuff? It's really hard, it's not, we're not really, we cannot tax dividends, for example. It's how can we change how they are being calculated? So, it's a pretty to think about. Thank you very much. Can I have your um, slides so that I may answer each point? Yeah, uh, because it would help me yeah. to remember <laughs> everything. Otherwise, uh, so let's get back. Uh, Yeah, if I understand correctly this point, you're pointing at the, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so does the measure concern only public corporations? That was the, the point, right? I guess. Yes. Yeah. I would say no. Of course, we may more readily think of public corporations because of pressures by shareholders, but still, uh, corporations that are not public would have their objective changed. And even if you have a manager that is at the same time a shareholder, which is the case for small businesses, managers are at the same time shareholders, should they wish to receive income, they should respect these objectives in this formula. So it does not only uh, concern uh, public corporations, but all kinds of corporations, since it changes the way income is calculated. No matter uh, your shareholder on the financial market or a simple shareholder with not on the financial market. No? But if, if, if it's your own company, yeah. you can be willing to not receive the amends for a while just as a matter of expanding your business, doing whatever, and being no pay with no pay. If you're a small business owner, you can't really not receive a salary for a year. Yeah. But, it, but it, is, it raises a valid point because uh, it is often uh, argued that uh, the only goal of companies is profit maximization. Yeah. But it can be argued that the actual goal of companies is uh, power to survive and to create certainty. And although profit maximization might be a tool to achieve that, it can still be reasonable to um, basically accept no income for a quarter to, um, to gain market share and then just in the next quarter start. Yeah, okay, but why do you talk about quarters? Mm -hmm. uh, because yeah, dividends are usually, years. but uh, yeah. dividends, if yeah, I understand correctly, are usually paid out quarterly instead of yearly. Dividends? No, no, once a year. Ah, okay. Yeah. At the same time, I mean, it can be reasonable for them uh, to, um, to accept no income for a year if that means they gain market share. What would be the points if you wait to be? Yeah, but the difference is that if you have a public corporation, yeah. you have the shareholders to make pressure for you yeah. to change your behavior. Okay, so if then. If you're like a family or a small company, you, you don't still have, have. Because you wish to receive income as shareholders. Uh, for tax purposes, it's, it's, it's better. And it's another kind of. <laughs> it's a reward for you. The salary is fixed. And really, family corporations wish to have uh, shareholders' income. No. Really, because it's a reward for their no, um, of course, I'm that the work. Yeah. The difference is like the, the time frame can be yeah. like way longer. Yeah, you have a point. There is a difference in, 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 in time frame. Right. Of course, the pressure is like day to day pressure in financial markets, and the time frame is, is yeah. Uh, but still, you have this change in objective, I would say, that concerns also other kinds of uh, companies, but with a different time frame, I would say. Uh, so your example, um, okay, uh, why not? Uh, it would be a bit tricky. Um, 
still the suppliers that allows you, for instance, to uh, have many greenhouse gas emissions, still the suppliers could not uh, pay payments, if I understand correctly, or it's your own, by your own activity. You're saying here, it could be the case that from time to time, companies wish to artificially increase their greenhouse gas emissions so that they may cut it drastically the years after. Well, okay, why not? Why not? It would be um, a point, but still in the long run, uh, well, in terms of financing investments, in terms of uh, communication, it's not really, I mean, efficient in terms of communications. So everybody is aware on, on, on the markets that the objective is this one. And so I would say, uh, yeah, it, maybe it would be used from time to time, but I'm not sure how much, how often, uh, yeah. Is it, isn't it possible to use some kind of average over years? Yeah, why not? We, we could we could smooth, and and yeah, this is a good point. This is open to you can tinker with the formula to improve it. Yeah, why not to smooth it so that it may be less rewarding to do such artificial increase? Why not? Yeah. Uh, of course, the formula is here to debate, and you may improve it. I mean, just I'm just conveying the idea, right? Uh, yeah, why not? Um, okay. Uh, so, and this was how investment is planned. So, it, I would I, I consider it a matter of calibration, no? Uh, yes. Because uh, it pays really to have a huge investment, so that we may have hefty income, a very big income. Uh, and the calibration is done in such a way that you should not delay your investment because, well, you wish to receive as high an income as possible and then you, you could have it. This is the way I, I see it. Uh, yeah, I guess it was already, the point was already made. Uh, if you're already a good company when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions, Still, you have this incentive to continue to reduce your emissions because this is a, a relative reduction that is rewarded. So, yeah, I guess, you, I would say you can always do better and it's a relative, so in percentage as you outlined. So, I mean, it's important not to allow companies to, to say, okay, let's have a sleep, I'm, a, I'm good, I'm close to zero, if we change the system, I mean. Uh, it, it would be better to drive companies constantly to improve. And since it is based on not absolute terms, but relative terms, I guess, I hope it will achieve this. Uh, well, I guess we will disagree on this one. I guess there is a time urgency, uh, a real big one. But again, I, I, I take it as a matter of calibration. And as I said with my two examples, with transportation and, and electricity use, there are very enormous sources of reduction that may be achieved quite uh, rapidly. And we should not refrain from doing this. I guess the ETS schemes have failed completely so far, and according to me, right? But maybe some of you here would agree. And uh, so really, you, we should tackle it radically. And since, again, when you use um, railway instead of 40 tons trucks, you divide by 11 your, uh, uh, your emissions. So you have tremendous possibilities. And transportation is the main source of carbon dioxide emission. The main source. We're not talking about <coughs> planes. The media love planes. When it comes to France, it's 1.2 percent of all you know, greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So now well, let's talk about real issues: transportations, uh, electricity, use solar panels, use uh, wind-generated uh, electricity, etc. Et and then you have 
you have a tremendous impact and a rapid one because these technologies exist, they're efficient, and you can invest on them. This is, well, this is what I would say. Uh, there is no possibility, I did not mention it, and you're right, I should have. There is no possibility of carbon offsetting in, in climatism. No, because I consider it greenwashing, basically. Period. Forget about it. Uh, I guess it was the. I'm not sure that to understand this question, but it's um, so capital flight. Yeah, the, it may be the case that you have a soft capital flight, as you mentioned, so as to benefit from the higher microeconomic profits still in the country. But again, I would say it's a matter of calibration. If emails are way higher than dividends, why make capital flights if you could have higher income with emails? I guess it's a matter of calibration. I, I would see, is it rightly calibrated? I would say, I hope so, I guess. But absolute certainty is out of the question in, in what I presented. Uh, I would say, because of these two examples, we may have other examples, like in, in, in the buildings, for instance. Buildings also, because of the heat, because of the electricity you use, it's really, you know, um, I don't have it. Uh, I don't know what the regulation is when it comes to other countries, but uh, you may, oh yeah, there are a few here. When it comes to buildings in, 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 oh. yeah. in French, in France, I mean, we have this to um, assess how much energy you waste in the buildings. So you come up with a letter uh, from a, well, here the better, here the worst. And really, uh, I guess, if my memory does not fail me, from, you know, from C to J, I, I guess, uh, from C to J, I guess it's times nine, the energy. So my, if my memory does not fail me, it's, but it's around these numbers. So by reducing, by improving uh, the buildings, you have tremendous sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And the, again, the technologies exist. In the long run, it's even profitable in, in the very long run if we may think in profitability terms. Again, this is not here, but even if you think in profitability, profitability terms, it's profitable in the very long run to improve the buildings. Uh, so, I mean, it would be easy. I mean, it's, it's frustrating to know that we have the technology, we have the resources, it would be kind of easy to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And we do not do it, we do not implement it. Uh, so, and, and, and this is well known. Uh, so the point here is, because it's easy to divide your emissions, then it will, uh, if you try to calculate the emissions with divisions of uh, your greenhouse gas emissions, then you come up with very high income. Uh, so I would say, part of the appeal, I would say, maybe I'm wrong, but part of the appeal is that emens might be a promise of higher income for shareholders than the actual system. Because there are these unexploited sources of greenhouse gas reductions. Hmm. Have I answered your points more or less? <laughs> Maybe. And one further question yeah, yeah, that yeah. I would have. Um, and then after we engage in the discussion with the rest of the yes. room. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, there was also one question is what happens if the amounts that are calculated yeah. uh, are unreasonably high for yeah. the company ah, yeah, and they would not be able to pay it? 
Then, as I said, it's the maximum amount distributable. Then you may choose as shareholders, okay, let's not distribute the whole amount, but half the amount or a third of the amount. And but can I carry that on then to other? Yeah. Okay. So that you may be rewarded. Uh, yeah, a bit like retained earnings, but when it comes to climate change mitigation, yeah. Okay, so. Just Please. to yeah. clarify that I am still not getting what the source of the events are. Yeah. So what does he mean when he says unreasonably high? As in, where wh can you just maybe write the accounting form for any of the cases? Like for the first, when it's a, it's a cost, when everybody is an employee. And so it would be a I cost. Mean, I don't know where the money is generated from. Would yeah, this is, this is a book entry. So this is, for, uh, so you have a cost, a cost, and you have also a liability account at the same time. No, uh, right? say that's where in the first case, so you're saying that uh, the emails can be considered like wages. Yeah. So what is the input and what is the output? So where is it on, like just an accounting? You, you need not have an input. On an, an account, in accounting terms, you may just have a cost and on the other side, a liability. You need not have an input. Mm -hmm. but, um, the yeah, but in the end, of course, uh, you may have to pay uh, the immense. And it, it may be the case, so I guess maybe your point is, uh, in the end, it may be the case that you should pay more emails that you have money on your bank account. Right. It may be the case, yeah. right. So then you may uh, have to borrow the money. Okay. You're saying that that's happening anyway to fund investments. Companies can also borrow and they can fund investments even if they have no uh, profits. So, um, but if, will it not make, again, the financial system more unstable if I'm not understanding where because it means that constantly credit has to be created. Yeah. Or uh, it, it could mean that. I mean, it could. This is on a microeconomic perspective. It could be the case, but on a macroeconomic perspective, it's very likely that you have higher profits, thus more money on average. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very likely. I'm not saying with absolute certainty. Uh, uh, so, on a microeconomic perspective, it could be the case yeah, that one company has to borrow money. Okay. Could be the case, but still, it's since its objective uh, is fulfilled, <coughs> maybe the bank would see it as a sign of uh, good performance and would be uh, willing to uh, lend the money. It, it might be the case. Uh, of course, the bank will also have a re uh, regard to um, the possibility of a bankruptcy, an eventual bankruptcy. Uh, as I said, uh, the bankruptcy rules still apply, so you should not be unprofitable for too long a period of time, for sure. So there is a nuance here. Here, uh, this, this uh, Profit is not totally discarded. It's, the objective is no more maximization of profits, but profit, we may say, so to speak, that profit is a matter of efficiency. You shouldn't use more resources than you create resources, or you should, shouldn't use more values, provided prices are correctly determined than uh, you create values. So, so to speak, we may see profits as a kind of an e efficiency uh, requirement. I'm not sure I'm answering. So it, I'm not saying profits do not have any role to play. I'm saying it has a role to play. But it's a different kind of uh, rationale. More this nice. was the idea I was trying to convey. Okay. okay. Uh, oh, so yeah. So ma maybe I, I will do like this, <laughs> and then go back to okay, and we'll achieve some kind. Of, okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is <coughs> about redistribution because I find the idea of mitigating climate change uh, with aggregated demand and all that it's very intriguing. But I, what I don't understand yet is 
if you say you have higher amends than dividends, for example, right now, my logic would be, okay, there's a higher um, amount of money or what, whatsoever um, attributed to shareholders, but at the same time, you have the redistribution mm -hmm. aspect in your formula. How does that go together? That's uh, sorry, sorry, I, I, I uh, rephrase like, it. Uh, yeah. I'm really not sure if I understand this correctly, yeah. but if we you argued you would have higher amends, no. for example, no. in my logic, that would mean um, higher amends for shareholders. Yeah. Uh, and not work to say you would so you would rather have a redistribution away from workers. Do you understand that correctly? Um, when you consider three objectives, it might be the case that inequalities are increasing. Yes, is this is what my, you mean. My, my question is, how does that go together? Higher amends with the one of the objective. Objective yeah, it, it, have in the that, that could be a, an upsetting when it comes to this objective. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you, you may have you may have high amounts and still ri uh, raising inequalities. Okay. Yeah, it, it's the case. Exactly. When you make the calculations, if you have a look at the at the paper, uh, I, I did the math for the thirty uh, years before when it comes to France and the U.S. And there were times when inequalities, of course, increased. And still, uh, you could pay immense. But, but that would then also decrease aggregated demand, or more, if we assume the different propensities to consume. Yeah, yeah, you have so a point. Uh, yeah, what on balance would be what would be? Uh, yeah, on balance, as we said earlier, should always remain equal. Mm -hmm. So maybe on balance, it would reduce a little bit aggregate demand. Um, but if people are poorer, they shouldn't. They should save less. And in the macroeconomic formula, you have I minus S W. So you have so profits should be even higher. Mm -hmm. So you ha should have higher profits in the end. Yeah, it makes sense. I just yeah. wanted to know. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm thinking about so <laughs> with you. So okay, uh, yeah, but it could be the case that you have uh, rising inequalities. This is an objective, merely an objective, and sometimes you fail your objectives. Yeah, as we are all too painfully uh, aware. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. My question is: uh, uh, How do you think about the implementation of these policies in the poor countries? Uh, what do you mean? Should it be a specific kind of uh, In the your presentation, you said that uh, uh, macroeconomic consequences uh, of the, this policy should be uh, uh, higher in investments, but in developed com uh, countries, you don't have uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I can say, uh, don't have more investments. So, uh, do you think? Uh, can we uh, implement this policy in, de in developed countries or poor countries? Uh, I would say because most of what is happening is due to developed countries, we have a debt. Yes. And the burden of adjustment should lay more on the shoulders of companies from developed countries. And from poor countries, um, Maybe we could implement this measure, but then we should have also a financial system that could help fund, finance these investments. I'm not saying uh, it's a uh, cure-all, right? You shouldn't care about anything else. Yeah, and especially in poor countries, then you should revamp uh, the financial system also. And with the help, with the help of uh, maybe um, central banks or Maybe you should have other also instruments. <coughs> I'm not sure I'm answering uh, your remark. Uh, uh, but in, I guess in terms of objectives, again, the objectives, you're not always compelled to succeed in your objectives. But in terms of, of objectives, it's a good starting point, I would say, to change the objectives of the system. Of course, it's not a cure-all. <laughs> the problem is, uh, uh, is it in the de developed countries, yeah. and uh, uh, now they they are facing the problem of sol uh, solving the problem. Yeah. So the one who are facing the problem who cannot resolve his own problem, how can he go to help uh, 
uh, those who I don't know uh, if we want like a specific point. Je voulais dire en fait que les pays développés ils font face à ce problème de changement climatique que dans leur économie ils n'arrivent même pas à résoudre. Dans ce cas, euh, comment eux-mêmes d'abord avoir les moyens financiers pour pouvoir le résoudre dans, le problème, dans leur pays, c'est un problème quoi. Et maintenant, dans quelle, dans, dans quelle mesure pour avoir les moyens, bien, de quelle bo bonne volonté pour pouvoir aller aider les autres à, à résoudre les mêmes problèmes que même n'arrivent pas à résoudre dans le dans le pays quoi. So you fear that if mm. um, we use the system in developed countries, then we would not help poor countries anymore. Is this your point? En fait, ça va, ça va se substituer à l'aide que l'on doit finalement oui, oui. de notre dette climatique aux pays les plus pauvres. Exactement. Vous avez peur que si jamais on met ça en place, ça se, on, on, finalement on n'aime plus les pays pauvres à, à faire face à leurs défis mm. qui sont euh, peut-être avant tout euh, économiques et sociaux. Enfin, C'est ça votre... Exactement. D'accord. Mm. Uh, ok, I uh, haven't thought about that. Uh, Well, um, I don't have the answer, quite frankly. So I, I should think more about that. I'm, I'm, uh, well, I did not think of that. So sorry. What about the question? Uh, the, I, no, <laughs> the question, no he, his point was, his point was, um, if we implement this in developed countries, oh. because developed countries are responsible for the great bulk of what is underway. Mm. And so to speak, we have a debt towards the poorest countries in the world, on the planet. So, <laughs> Wouldn't it be the case that we only ma care about our own reductions, our, mm. speaking from the perspective of developed countries, and we will not help poor countries anymore? So this is the, the point of fear of, uh, well, maybe we could uh, uh, have another round of discussions, diplomatic discussions, I don't know. I, I, I guess this is a, I would say no, another issue, but a very relevant one, but uh, quite, quite frankly, I haven't uh, thought about that. I would say that if developed countries still reduce their emissions, then it would be a big relief because they're responsible for 62% uh, of uh, uh, nowadays. And if we include the importations from China, it's, it's even more, and importations from India. Uh, we're responsible for even more of uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, so it or could already be a, a blessing for uh, all countries, but still it shouldn't come at the expense of the help that poorest countries need. Well, but I'm not a politician, so <laughs> I can't say more. Uh, sorry. So I, I, I will go like this and then, if you don't mind, okay? Uh, so, yeah, and then. Okay, so I guess from the distance and then closer and then like this. Okay, so <coughs> my question is about how pragmatical this is, mainly focus on capital flight. No. So the, you, the answer you gave was it's about how you calibrate it. Yeah. If you calibrate it well, it shouldn't happen. Yeah. And the, the question is uh, we have different sectors that have different levels of how easy it is yeah. to yeah. cut your emissions. You made the clear example of transportation, yeah. but there are yeah. sectors and firms that have yeah. definitely harder yeah. life in yeah. changing that level. Yeah. Even considering the yeah. green and really green yeah. firms, in that case, you would have maybe that the transportation sector could be made a bit more, uh, very much more uh, radically more uh, environmentally friendly. But other firms and other sectors would just have, see a lot of uh, capital flows towards the countries not implementing this uh, this policy, thus having some some gains in not implementing the policy that maybe uh, hypothetically and I wish it was up, it was true. Some yeah. most countries would, most Western yeah. countries would. Um, if I understand you correctly, you're talking about the heterogeneity of the sectors. They do not have the same potential when it comes to greenhouse gas reductions. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> well, I would say my first point would be provocative. So what? <laughs> so what? We need no, but the, the, uh, this macroeconomic uh, positive yeah. effects. Yeah. Just 
No, no, this, this was hey, to, to be provocative. I mean, no, 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 the, no. The, the burden of adjustment should lay especially on those who pollute more. So this is a first provocative point. I, mean, I would answer seriously to a point. Okay. Uh, um, I would say uh, that still there is, you're right, heterogeneity, uh, but still you use your electricity, still you have offices, and you have a great source of potential reduction with electricity and offices and what your employees do still. Even if, of course, if you produce goods, you have a higher potential, of course, because then with transportation you may cut even more. But still, you have, I would say, a, a big potential. Despite, yeah, there is this. You need a lot of energy. Yeah. Now, you can rely on greener sources of knowledge, like having the lights on or the yeah. energy doesn't change much. It's the production process that yeah. fix a lot. And also the In those cases, you, yeah. you, you would have the amount, the amount mm -hmm. really hard to, to, to increase them, really hard to increase them. Uh, again, uh, let's think of the reduction in relative terms. And the formula, it was you reward relative reductions, not absolute reductions. So still you have an, an, an incentive to, uh, even if you, your starting point is, is lower than other companies, still you have a, an incentive, I would say a powerful incentive, to cut uh, these emissions, despite the heterogeneity, I, I would say. Okay. I, mean, I think you need more than macroeconomists to answer this question, you shall go and see larger economists, and I think mm. the macroeconomists cannot answer this. <laughs> no, <I'm sorry. laughs> the other question that is really yeah, yeah. it's just well, what about new firms? Because yeah. new firms would have the incentive of like, just going with the worst possibility, possible, uh, yeah. the most um, environmentally yeah. unfriendly uh, process, and then right. slowly and then slowly, slowly yeah, and then be just to yeah. understand how how this could be. Better. And maybe we could start after three years, or or maybe we could smooth. smooth anyway. it, it was a, a good suggestion. May, remain <laughs> in case I, in case I, I thank you in one of my cases. <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, half joking only. Uh, <laughs> half. Is it the better half? That's the open question. Um, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, it's it's right. open to modifications, right? You have the, the outline and. Uh, and you may think of loopholes and try to improve it. Uh, yeah. So then I can so continue I can and then, yeah. I have two uh, yeah. very quick points. And I'm not yeah. going to concentrate on the minutiae of the model because, of course, it, their adjustments are possible. I do have uh, one issue with the idea that the macroeconomic consequences and investment will increase. Yeah. I, I very strange because the reason why the world is locked in fossil fuels, it's exactly because they are more um, profitable. So forcing the economy to green will never produce more profits because the, optim the, the, the optimizing path for profits is exactly the, is exactly the fossil one. I really believe we have to take the macroeconomic hit as a burden and roll with it. Um, the second point here is um, about the, the, sh the shareholders and their new uh, role in this new economic system. So basically, they are managing firms according to a series of rules led by the state, and then and then they are paid by funds that are uh, say um, consigned by the that are uh, say uh, so say um, blocked by the state that then unblock their funds to pay them. So really, um, what is the difference between um, a shareholder and a mere government planning a government government planner, or if you're thinking a company, a presidium of government planners? Uh, basically, they're fulfilling the same role, except that uh, they don't have particular um, uh, good um, um, credentials with the exception of being rich. So why not just uh, get rid of the shareholder as a shareholder, nationalize the decision-making process, because effectively you already have state planners doing it. Uh, so why not actually get something, someone who's qualified and not just rich to manage the companies? Because it seems like a uh, natural way to go, but we're just missing a step Yes, I guess it's a fear of being disruptive, but it's already very disruptive, so might as well embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so the first point I would beg to differ when it comes to uh, the levelized cost of energy nowadays. 
was not the case previously, but nowadays, the LCOE, the lightless cost of energy of solar panels and wind offshoring uh, generated electricity, this cost is lower than uh, fossil fuels. Fixed costs are incorporated in fossil fuels and the yeah, but so forth, so they also matter. Not yeah, this is the only. Market. Yeah, but the long-term uh, cost is lower nowadays. I could uh, give you a few references. Maybe you have other no, references. And I, I would more say it's it's more irrational. The fact that we stick to fossil fuels nowadays is more irrational. And uh, so we need um, some big change. Uh, why not state intervention? Well, <laughs> I would say. Uh, the power relationships in, in, in all countries that I know, the bit of, really it's not in favor of a massive state intervention. I see it as a pragmatic way. Shareholders really have the power, they have the media. Uh, you know that X or Twitter uh, favors the right-wing policies by a large amount. I've read many things about this. One of my uh, current work is about uh, the link between capitalism and post-truth. And I can tell you X and YouTube are really in favor of far-right extremism, really by large amounts. Uh, we could talk about that later on if you're interested. I, I don't see that the power relations are so much in favor of business as usual, so much in favor of free enterprise. Uh, we would only scare people by saying, let's have uh, the big state, the big government, who could plan everything, and uh, let's kill all the shareholders. And let's have lunch with shareholders, <laughs> but somewhere. grilled, right, shareholders. It's the only kind of meat we'll eat, right? But but creating a lot is not in terms of state intervention. Sorry? Creating a lot of calculate a different way of evidence is not in terms of state intervention. Is well, it's just a, issuing a guidelines. They, they already exist. I could show you the DEFRA guidelines. Any change for any investors. Sorry? Not any change for investors not really welcome. It's just like they're not really willing to be a little bit. Even if they have a possibility of having more, the change already problems that they're making. Yeah, but I would say I will I partly believe in Socrates' paradox. Socrates' paradox says uh, people do not wish to do evil and yet they do evil. They have their perspective, they have the way of, of seeing things. I'm sure that you can find shareholders that are genuinely convinced because this is what is being taught in every economic course that markets, free markets self-regulate. So if you have the carbon pricing scheme, then you end up in the best of all worlds. So you've been taught that for years. Maybe you've been taught such kind of economic courses, right? Markets have regulate. So I'm convinced that with the existing scheme, it's all the better. Then we will uh, tackle uh, climate change. And I'm, I'm sincerely convinced of that. So, I mean, when I put myself in the shoes of <laughs> shareholders, right? Actual uh, current shareholders. So I would say that I'm not sure that all shareholders, all investors um, do not care about the planet. It's because they have yeah, been taught, and, and in the media, and again, and YouTube, and, and so on, and so forth, you have, and also you have the growing skepticism about climate change, also. The conspiracy theories are really becoming more and more popular uh, on social media, and yeah, so, that's a tricky issue, but I would say that maybe you have uh, something, uh, a Levi here, you, you may act on uh, a leverage, you know, to act on, because people genuinely want, at, uh, at least maybe most of them, or a big part of them, uh, want to actually tackle climate change. It's just that they think differently. Yeah, this is an open question, an open <laughs> remark. Uh, but really, if you wish to convince somebody, you shouldn't take for granted that this person does not want the situation to change. Otherwise, then this people will be angry, would not understand your point, and you could not come to terms. So as a strategy for discussion, uh, you, uh, I mean, I, 
let's say with this proposal, there is no excuse. This is one of yeah, the of points. No. There's no, you could have high income by doing this. So you have no excuse to refuse a change. Then it would clarify the situation. Are you really sincere? Are you really sincere when you say you care about climate change or are you not? At least we could have this. At least. I hope you could have more. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I think that that's true when you do the transition and the aggregates that you have to notice that in sectoral perspective, the transition implies like there are some central industries. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I was. I mean, that, that, that vision of the transition is true when you think the transition on an aggregate basis. Yeah. yeah. When you start, you start looking at sectors, you realize that there are a lot of sectors that the transition implies that they are going to disappear, and that's the issue with this kind of factor. There are sectors with highly, with a lot of infrastructure that is positive based, or you have also agriculture with cattle, and for them the transition implies cut off. You have yeah. to change the activity. Yeah, yeah but it's, li it's like it's like carbon prices. Yeah? Yeah. You change. Yeah, but at the end, in the design of policy, I think that's 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 the the tricky issue about our relationship because there are some sectors that the transition implies that independently of what happened, it, 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 the, there won't be returned because actually the, the, the sector should be uh, cut down. And so I think that's that's uh, like an, an issue that has to be considered because shareholders of the reading petroleum, it's yeah, and for them it's a bit different. But or what? I like to do. No. Really but I would say, yeah, yeah, you're talking about, uh, as I say, it's stranded assets. Of course, previously you had investments in fossil fuels, then you should think of a way to abandon them. But then you have an, an incentive to do so, because it could be rewarding to switch from oil to a solar, solar panel, and to use your, the money you earned from oil to uh, invest in solar panels or to produce. Solar panel. So, I guess it's important to have the incentives. I see your point, but I guess yeah. So, so, so sorry. I, I will do like this, right? So, no questions here. So again, here. Okay. But yeah. I, but I want to go on. Like, I mean, okay. there is no nice future possible for oil companies because mm -hmm. the profit is always less in in a renewable state. Yeah, but if profit is no longer the target, the yeah, yeah, but you will yeah. never like. Uh, shareholders of oil companies will, like, I mean, there will be a really big lobby yeah. against this. Okay. I see. There is uh, so long as we have the majority of constituents, yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, we don't care about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in, in more polite terms, uh, I would say the same as uh, Mr. Yeah, this is <laughs> the S word. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think my question has partly been answered, but I had a follow-up on the investments needed for buildings, infrastructure, solar panels. I mean, all of this is going to take energy, material costs, etc. So it's initially going to increase the emissions of a company. So a company would increase their emissions to somewhere down the line lower their emissions, but that might mean that in the first years, yeah. because they increase the emissions, they wouldn't actually be able to pay amends to the shareholders. So and you mean that you, you keep your, your previous that? investments and you have more investments, you keep the two. No, I'm trying to see your point. You're, so you said we need to invest, invest. in infrastructure yeah. Yeah. to make buildings more um, climate neutral. Okay. But these investments, like yep. you're going to need, if you are building this kind of infrastructure, yep. you're going to need material, you're yep. going to need energy for the construction yep. everything. So you increase investment, yes, but you also increase your emissions yep. initially. Yeah, for a year. Yeah, maybe. but yeah. that might mean that in that year or two, you wouldn't actually be able yeah. to pay out immense yeah, to your shareholders. Okay, but then you have, in the long run, high immense that you can distribute. You have a point, but yeah. stay up. Because I'm just this questioning whether yeah. you would get shareholders on board to agreeing to Well not it's just have one year or two when you're now allowed to distribute immense versus twenty years or thirty years that mm. you enjoy the benefits of uh, making carbon neutral buildings. Mm. And I guess and also the point that, that was made by Mr. Uh, that if you increase one year the, um, the greenhouse gas emissions, 
then you have the potential to decrease it the other mm -hmm. years, and so maybe there is some kind of compensation. I mean, there's one or two years versus 20 or 30 years. So I, I guess the calculation, well. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe the, the one or two more, wow. or not more, and those who already. Well, uh, but, but I, I did not, so yeah. sorry, I will. I will uh, <laughs> Could you be the last question, please? Um, I have places to go. Oh, oh. oh. so if you all agree, maybe others. Okay. <laughs> Over. Yeah. yeah. You've been waiting. We just so go actually. Maybe. Yeah, you've been waiting longer. I don't want to cost the motion. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Take one. Or yeah. Just no. Yeah. Okay. So let's start. Okay. So this alternative climatism only targets greenhouse uh, gas emissions which are probably like the main target while speaking about climate change, but also clean energies have socio-ecological impact. So, for example, if companies can still profit by increasing their production, even if it is with clean energies, wouldn't it, wouldn't it increase the socio-ecological impacts of these type of energies? I'm not sure to understand your point, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so if they can, if, com if companies can still profit, yeah. while increasing their production, if it, even if it is with clean energies, that okay. doesn't emit like a lot of greenhouse emissions. But also clean energies have socio-ecological impacts, so wouldn't it increase the socio-ecological impacts of cli what clean energies? What do you mean uh, by sociological impact? What do you mean by that? Like the socio-ecological impacts of green energies, for example, extractivism of minerals, um, Are you, you mean the material uh, impact? Okay, yes. um, yeah, th this is only the focus is here is only on climate change. But as I said previously, you may add in the future like uh, a material footprint in the formula, so mm -hmm. so as to uh, mirror wh what you say. Because of course, a material footprint does matter. It's just not to scare people too much in the first place. You go little by little. Uh, and then you may add some other ecological objectives because, of course, there are sound uh, objectives and we should uh, deal with the material footprint of uh, economic activity, for sure. So in the future, it's, yeah, pipelines, I hope. So maybe some other question? No? One more question? I do have Last a question, one. but it's, it's actually much longer as oh. a discussion. So a short talk with Who has a short Yeah, one? I was yeah. planning on yeah, it. It's okay, Max, I yeah. got your point. <laughs> it's, I don't know if it's short, but I <laughs> wanted to... This is a bad start. Um, <laughs> you, like go back to your or original formula about the change in global warming potential. Okay. You write in your paper, it's calculated as the co like with common metrics as yeah. measure. Is it production-based emission of the company? Um, or how, how is it calculated? Because if it's production-based emission, I think you could criticize that, for example, a company said producing only solar panels, which are very necessary. There is the need of a huge expansion in the production in that, and maybe on the cost of per um, solar panel, a little bit higher emissions, but the long run effects in 20 years are